Welcome back. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. Older generations of Chinese scholars, now in their twilight of their lives, have made remarkable contributions in science and literature, honor for their motherland and benefit to humanity. Their spirit and charisma deserve to be well documented and remembered by generations to come. Recently, a photo exhibition of a young Chinese photographer was held at Peking University dedicated to these legendary figures. All take part in history, but few drive its progress. They are the scholars, writers, thinkers, and scientists. Their contributions have shaped the future of the country, and the fruits of their labor have, in one way or another, benefited the world. The foundation they laid down allowed the younger generation to thrive with unprecedented opportunities. One beneficiary is Xiao Mengya, a young man born at the end of the 20th century. He grew up in Beijing, then studied photography in New York. Through his lens, he paid a public tribute to a senior generation of esteemed professors from Peking University, riding on the legacy of the past masters. A generation of proud young Chinese are writing their own legends. Steve, welcome to CGTN. It's been a pleasure and my honor. 26 academic masters, great masters from China. It must be quite a project. Yeah, it's a, it's a big project. I got a lot of help from my family and my, my, my friends. No wonder you were raised up in Beida, in Peking University, right? Yeah, I spent my childhood in Beida. Some of the professors, the, the masters, I've been worked by, but I didn't know. So hopefully, using my photos, I can let the young people to know all these masters. Well, let's talk about some of these great masters because many of our audience coming from maybe all over the world might not necessarily know their names, but certainly know their work. Um, for example, Xu Professor Xu Yuanzhong. He's, uh, he, he's a very famous translator. He won the World Class Translation Prize recently, 20, 20, 2014. He did a lot of translation for Chinese traditional poetry and literature, mm -hmm. for example, like Tao Te Ching, Chu Tzu, Amulet, The Story of West Chamber, mm -hmm. a lot of them, yeah. yeah. All of these are huge names in Chinese literature history. Yeah, and we learned that in, since we were a child. So what was it like for you to go there and meet him? Where did you meet him? I, m I met him in, uh, in a hospital. Really? Yeah, he broke his leg in the um, mid-moon uh, mid festival. He, he was riding a bicycle in the campus and he 97 years old riding a bicycle? Yeah, it's very dangerous. <laughs> Everybody talks about that, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't follow the rules, you know. He's, he always cares about, about like what he cares, like <laughs> for his books, his writing, he's very productive. He did, um, I think, thousands of translations in his life. He worked for si over 60 years. <laughs> When you took the photo of him, mm -hmm. you didn't show much of his sentimental side. Yeah, I think my photos are kind of subjective, I think, because I want to create something strange but familiar. Mm -hmm. The people you, you are familiar, but uh, the image itself is kind of strange. You haven't seen that person in that situation before. But I think that's a new perspective of the visual information. Well, yeah. Professor Xu, even though he's very charismatic, but certainly, I mean, he's a very warm person, right? He's very inviting in a way. But there are others who are not necessarily so, who have very different personalities when you are filming them when you are taking photos of them? Oh, for example, like Li Ning. Yeah, he's a very famous... One of the most well-known Chinese economists. Economist. And uh, he only gave me 15 minutes in his home. Um, it was a Saturday. 
only 15 minutes in the in the Saturday afternoon, and uh, before I came into him his home, um, he called me and said, "Oh, um, faster, faster." Uh, <laughs> Like the Chinese economy, faster, faster. <laughs> faster, yeah, yeah. Time is money, and um, so um, I was kind of nervous actually, because um, I I got to la flash and all the equipments, and I have to set up and took the photo, mm -hmm. and uh, s but I did it. He looks strict in my photo, and uh, that's how I feel about him. Yeah, so I think that's a um, uh, contrast mm -hmm. between him and uh, Mr. Xi. Well, there are others that you also. Took photo of. For example, these days China has been talking about, you know, what is the future of Chinese uh, chip making. And there is an, a couple who are chip makers, and uh, they're, I, I, would, I would say they are the best chip maker in China. Wang Yangyuan and uh, Yang Fuqing, especially Yang Fuqing, she went to Russia um, in the 50s to learn about the computer science. She really cares about her look in the, in the image. So after I telling her I would take photo for her, she let me to um, check the location two weeks per, um, previously and um, um, ask me about the plan and uh, the setting of the, the shooting. And uh, after the shooting, she even do the post production with me in the um, in the sh uh, in the printing company to adjust the hue and the saturations <laughs> for the photos <laughs> because she cares about the quite the dominating person, I guess. Exactly, she's trying to be perfect. In did you all did situations. you like the eventual hue and the color that she chose? Um, I think I like it, but because I set up all the, the settings, so actually she only did some change in her face, so mm -hmm. I think it's, it's good. Academics, when they are doing scientific research, research, not many people would assume that they would be, you know, necessarily that much care about how they look in front of the public, but actually they do. Yeah, they do. But many wonder, you know, 26 great masters in their own field. Why is this project so important to you? Why photographs so important to you? Me and the uh, old masters are all from different generations. I think the contrast is the most interesting thing in this project. My generation is different. We are visual people, and um, we prefer to to check the image first, and um, that's the way we we know people actually. Yeah. Do you think eventually people will be looking at the works that these great masters have been doing? I think it's a process. Uh, hopefully after they got interested in, in, in my pictures, the photos, they, 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 they got a chance to, to look at their works in the end. And I think it's a process. The first, of all, the first thing I would like to do is to draw their attention on the, all those masters. Wonderful project. What a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Mrs. Tian. It's my honor. The real China lies beyond the Euro stereotypes portrayed in sensational reporting. It's important to ask, what is the country really like? What are the Chinese really thinking? What do the youth in China really aspire to be? Even though those questions have been asked by generations of China hands, they have become more relevant when China opens up and reaches out to the world. No wonder Zach Dishwald, a young American of the post-90s generation, set the record straight. After living and working in China, he put his life stories, including a nuanced view of Chinese peers, into a book entitled Young China, How the Restless Generation Will Change Their Country and the World. It's an inside look at China's post-90s generation, which kept on dreaming and thriving. I invited Zach to CGTN for a chat. We started by talking about the so-called colored lens that some use to see China. Zach, what a pleasure to have you on CGTN. Thank you so much for having me, Wei. But you know, from time to time, people question whether the everybody understand the narrative mm -hmm. about China. Yeah. It's the real narrative. 
Have you been consciously thinking about that question? There's two different audiences. There's the narrative that, that we know from here in Beijing, and that's an elite narrative that follows the China narrative every day. And then there's the rest of the world. The rest of the world sees young people as little emperors, spoiled brats. They don't see them as incredibly talented students, incredibly talented thinkers, increasingly innovative young people. They don't see that. They see little emperors. Uh, they don't see China as an increasingly innovative space. They don't see people as independent thinkers. They see people as part of a large whole. Even the, the cover of my book, the first picture that my, uh, that my publisher showed me was a group of Chinese kids all in student gear. All from, from a distance, everyone looking more or less the same. They see a group, a mass of people. They don't see individuals. So to have a young person on the front of the cover who is thoughtful, who is thinking about the world, who is alone in a big city, in the West, outside of China, that's a new narrative, focusing on the individual. Uh, the born after 90 generation in particular is known as the me generation. Right. It's the first generation not as focused on the collective and thinking about what do I want? What do I dream of? What do I want for my family? That's a different set of considerations. Very interesting. On the other hand, there's the issue of you know, the party, the mm -hmm. state, and the individual in China. What is it like, that relationship? I mean, this young generation grew up open-minded. They grew up with the internet. They grew up watching, you know, it's not just studying Western history. I have friends who can quote, How I Met Your Mother, uh, and Barney <laughs> from How I Met Your Mother, but also Martin Luther King Jr. They know our history. They've studied the West. They are far more fluent in our culture than we are of China, easily. Um, two, or excuse me, one-third of all students studying abroad in America are from China. Two-thirds of all passport holders in China are under the age of 37. You know, that's, that's the born after 80 and born after 90. Right. So this young generation has seen the world. And more than any other generation in, in Chinese history, they recognize that, you know, everywhere has problems. Much more so even than the older generation. They recognize that America isn't that great. Uh, and China has its problems too, but at least it's getting stuff done. And it's getting stuff done at a rate that provides them personally a better opportunity than being somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. But as you may know, when China is getting much wealthier mm -hmm. than it used to be, the growth rate is likely to slow down. Yeah. So is the changes of families and of life for the better, yeah. that's also likely to slow down. Uh -huh. Do you think if they can take it? I think this pride is more resilient than we give it credit for. I think young people are recognizing that it, it can be cool to be Chinese. It could be, you know, they can innovate internationally with the best of folks. When Jack Ma went to go have, have the largest IPO in the world from a creative industry uh, in New York, that's a message to young Chinese who had before thought only Westerners or Steve Jobs can be innovative, that, hey, we can be innovative too. You're seeing right now that young people are willing to sort of stand shoulder to shoulder internationally. The older generation didn't have that same sort of pride, mm. that belief in, in the strength of not just China as a country, but but Chinese as individuals. But now China and the United States, it's apparently in some kind of war, yeah. uh, shall we say, trade war. Even. Yeah. Um, do you think the Chinese young people that you've been interacting with, I'm sure during your book tour and stuff, you've been talking to them, your friends as well. Yeah. What do they think about that? I think rather than focusing on the trade war that's happening this year, what people are recognizing is that now there's parity between the two countries. Fifteen years ago, if you were to say China and America are in a battle of equals, people would have rolled their eyes. That wasn't the case. There's recently on, on the Chinese internet, there's, a, there's been a funny uh, World Cup uh, joke, which is Mei Zhong Bu Zhu. It's an old saying that means within, imperfect, or within something perfect there is a blemish or an imperfection. But literally it means America and China don't play soccer. <laughs> and so the joke is that Americans and Chinese, they're two strong, powerful countries. We just sit back and watch other people entertain us. <laughs> but what that, you know... The, so the, of course, that's just a joke. It's a joke, but, but what it sort of suggests underneath is right now that there are these two countries who are equals. Yeah. And I think that's what this young generation believes. Despite changes, there are always things uniquely Chinese that pull back people to a lifelong commitment in China. The food is a big part of it. Zach, after living in Sichuan, best known the world for its hot and spicy cuisine, was excited to tell me about all the magic in the dishes. That's also a peek into the real life in Middle China.
Chengdu is a place really you can enjoy yourself. Absolutely. Uh, great food, great atmosphere. People just take it easy, as they say. I got two questions for you about Chengdu. First is, what's your favorite food? First is kao yu. It's barbecued fish, technically, but it's barbecued fish, and then it's immersed in oil, and that oil is is sort of slow cooked with herbs and spices. Oh. You have a potato. You can, I mean, you can add a lot of different stuff and. Um, it's served in a hot pan. There's nothing like it that we have back home. Going to Kaoyu together with friends is really a big way for young people to hang out in Chengdu or in other cities across China. Absolutely. Uh, my friends and I make jokes about how the older generation in China used to focus on eating be eating bitter, right? Mm -hmm. And the joke now is that everyone in China just eats hot pot. <laughs> on one hand, you have the older generation working hard and having mm -hmm. to do delayed gratification. Chengdu is a great example of the want to huozaidangxia, to, to live in the moment. Mm. One of our favorite toasts in Chengdu is jinjiao youzhou, jinjiao zui. Oh, really? You to, guys say that? Today we have booze, so today we drink. It, <laughs> it's a commitment to being here now. The other thing is, what were you there for? It felt like the world was getting China wrong, uh, often focusing on old China versus young China. And by that, I don't just mean age. Uh, I don't just mean older people versus mm -hmm. younger people. I mean, there's an older perception of China, um, you know, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that isn't China today. You wrote about young people, particularly young boys in China, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about their future, think about marriage and the real estate. And what is exactly the relationship among all of these phenomena? China's property market is propped up on a marriage market. Different than anywhere else in the world, so many of the young people I talked to, particularly men, described the frustration of having to own property in order to be seen an eligible bachelor, in mm -hmm. order to get married. It was that, you know, the ability to own property that allowed people to have, an, or allowed not just the woman in the relationship, but more their parents, that feeling of safety, that feeling of security. What that means is that they often have to bar borrow from their grandparents. They have to borrow from their parents. So you get this entire family structure saving money to support their child in order to buy an apartment. I think you're having some people bend to the pressure. I think you're having other people reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. When you look at places like Shenzhen, when you look at people, especially in the startup community, mm -hmm. they're not buying apartments anymore because it doesn't make sense. The IMF recently had a report that came out that said seven out of 10 of the least livable cities in the world in terms of housing market prices are in China, right. seven out of 10. So if you're a business person, you know that that doesn't make economic sense. But because there's the cultural imperative, young people are still buying it. So how is that having an impact, the so-called divide mm -hmm. or gap of wealth having on the young people? Have you met people from very different social groups? So one of the interesting things about being a foreigner in China, especially when you speak Chinese, is you can sort of hang out with a lot of different people. Yeah. So I've been on the side of the road eating shao ka with, uh, you know, 15, 15 quiet person, uh, and a Maserati will go by. And, and watching the faces of my friends change when they see that type of wealth, realizing that they're never going to be able to get that, that's something that they dream of, it's never going to happen for them. Um, I've had that experience. The other experience, though, I've also had. I've been in that Maserati with one of these ultra-rich young Chinese people watching people on the side of the street eating shao kao. And that person in the Maserati is describing to me how lonely they are. Because China has developed so fast, and really there's no international comparison for what China has achieved, especially in the last 27 or 28 years of my lifetime, uh, that China's extremes are further apart, far further apart. <laughs>